history of the world in six classes. So this time we're looking at uh, the second chapter, which is wine. Second part. Uh, last time we looked at beer and we introduced it before that. I wanted to show you quickly on the website here, and it's just um, wap.mrduez.com. You can check that out if you look at the website address here, wap.mrduez.com. That's where you'll find all of the different videos. What some consider to be a much more civilized drink is this thing called wine. Now, certainly, the Romans considered it to be more civilized, and that's one of the things we'll start with today. It's This is wine in ancient Greece and in the Roman Empire. So you've got a couple images here. At the very top is the Parthenon in Athens, Greece, top left. You've got the Roman senators on the right. Um, as you kind of page down the left-hand side there, you've got a symposium with uh, the Greeks. A Roman uh, who is drinking some, some wine out of a, a, a tasting bowl. And on the bottom right there, of course, is wine with the map of Italy behind it. And uh, I know what you're thinking right now. Isn't this just grape? And it really is. So let's get moving through here. We're going to start off uh, by saying that although wine is in the second part of his book, uh, Standage makes a point to say that grapes and uh, the drink that comes from grapes, the alcoholic drink that comes from grapes or wine, could have easily been tasted just as old or maybe even older than beer because it probably happened naturally and wine could have fermented and people could have drank it. Um, to make wine, you need to have fresh grapes. It's pretty simple. It's not that hard to do, really. The difficult thing is the storage. For beer, you can just store grain and add water to the process at any time. If you're going to produce wine, there's only certain parts of the world that can produce it well. And you see those listed here on the map below. Most of Europe, especially Southern Europe, some parts of uh, the United States and Canada, and a few parts there in South uh, America and the very tip of, of South Africa, and some very southern parts of Australia and New Zealand. So, the excellent beer of the mountains. This is a story about the Assyrian king who threw a massive party, basically celebrating the founding of a new city. And the king gave equal quantities of wine to beer. And that's the first time that you see that in world history. A lot of people were probably tasting wine, for, some of them maybe for the first time, because it wasn't something they could get very easily. Um, this went against the Mesopotamian culture. And remember, this is before Greece and Rome, so it's a little earlier. Transporting the wine to the new city is the hardest part. It's going to cost about ten times the amount to produce than it would to produce the, the locally brewed beer. So making wine demanded pottery that could preserve the liquid. You've got to store it, and it's much more difficult to store in comparison to beer. And fermenting grapes is difficult because very quickly can turn the wine from, um, from good tasting wine, I guess, I've never tasted it, but good tasting wine to vinegar and it would lose its taste properties. The cradle of Western thought began to emerge from barbarism, what, is what they call barbarism, when they learned to cultivate the olive and the vine. This is Thucydides. Standage writes about him on page 52 and 53. And what he's saying there is the masses drank the beer. The wide ranging number of people could afford beer. But wine was considered for the powerful, those with prestige and with privilege. And wine came to embody the Greek culture because it became more widely available, but it became a symbol of social differentiation. If you had a certain brand or type of wine, you were in a class above other people. Then the Greeks had a way of, it's sort of their own little party here, a small 15 to 20 people, I think at the most, of a symposium. All male except women who might come in to serve or dance or 
something like that. But they would serve, uh, serve some food. Then the wine was brought out. And the key there was they really felt like this is a way to get people to say the truth or bring out their true character by uh, introducing a little bit of alcohol into the equation. Just like beer, wine was also used as a medicine to clean wounds and as a safer drink than water, certainly. Roman farmers combined uh, the Greek influence with their own farming and background through this viticulture, growing grapes instead of grain, which they imported from colonies in North Africa. So it became like such a central part of the Roman world that they no longer were growing grain which you would think would be a main thing you'd need to um, have a large population um, thrive. But they would just bring it in. All roads led to Rome. The philosophy of drinking. Wine reveals what is hidden. That's Eratosthenes, the Greek philosopher in the 3rd century BCE. Wine reveals what is hidden. It's this idea that with a little bit of wine, it's going to grease the mental skids and someone's going to tell you exactly what they're thinking or their true character is going to come out. So the, the guys of Athens and ancient Greece developed an idea called philosophy, which is this pursuit of wisdom. And it is really a key part of Western civilization. Also the idea that men can improve upon themselves and individual, individualistically uh, learn and attain and do more. That is the whole idea behind kind of like freedom and this idea of the individual spirit. Today, we think about the American dream. You can rise and fall on your own, uh, on your own steam. If you work hard enough, you will be able to make it. Plato describes his mentor, the famously irascible Socrates, which I'm reading a great book about Socrates right now, um, was always in control of his drink. And that to me is a way of maybe saying Socrates was smart enough to understand that if I don't get drunk, I drink just a little bit, I'm going to be able to monitor the situation and learn from other people and what it is they have to say. And he was famously always trying to like get inside people's heads. So the principles of democracy, this shared bowl of wine, sharing of ideas, the best arguments and the best solutions would win. And this idea too, that men would drink from a single vessel, they all would share from that. And that's similar to the day, early days with, the, with beer that we discussed before. But in Greece, this democracy comes with a little bit of an edge. It's only men who can be citizens. Only men who could drink and discuss things in the symposium. Um, here is a very famous painting by Raphael. This is 1509, so this is way beyond the Greeks, but it's during the Renaissance time period where they're looking back at the classical period of Greece and Rome. And he uh, did this painting, which was called The School of Athens. Interesting because Socrates really wasn't around for this but they believe that's him in the center there and the academy was this school founded by Plato the school of Athens and it persisted throughout the Hellenistic period as a skeptical school so they looked at what was going on in the world and questioned things originally what Socrates had done and also paid with his life for that as we'll learn about when we get into um, chapters 4, 5, and 6 we'll also study the Greeks there Imperial Vine, Rome versus Greece. So you'll see the image there kind of build out the territories of the Roman Empire as it spread. One of the territories that the Roman Empire conquered was this little area right here called Greece. Thousands of little islands and the peninsula here that juts off the, the coast of, of uh, Europe. In the middle of the second century BC, the Romans had originally started there in the boot this little boot that's kicking the football and there's the goalpost at Gibraltar but this boot here is where Rome sits right about where the arrow is here and on seven hills <clears throat> the Romans conquer the Greeks but the Greeks in some ways conquer the Romans because their ideas their Greek gods and myths their alphabet the ar architecture education their construction this is all uh, a continuation really of the Greek way. The Romans did it better in some cases, 
like they uh, came up with a better way to do um, concrete and they could build bigger and and um, stronger buildings um, but the wine that embodied where the Rome had come from and what they had become cultivating the vine and working hard to produce wine was something that the people of the Roman Empire were very proud of and it became a, a, a again a cultural sophistication symbol it, it, you were in a certain class or you were of a certain importance if you had that certain kind of wine all roads lead to Rome therefore all vines lead to Rome it's another way of looking at it and we've said before that this massive demand creates a situation on the Italian peninsula where they're no longer making much grain and they're bringing in grain from all parts of the the Roman Empire and, and they're cultivating the vine but but done by slaves and we'll see much more about slavery as we go through this book and discuss it but slaves using slaves were used by the Romans to they had a problem they wanted to get something done they would throw manpower at it and slave power unfortunately and they had slaves for just about everything for dressing and bathing uh, the the people who were who were not slaves and what's interesting with the wine situation is that it got to a certain point where even slaves were permitted wine because it was such an important part of the culture Rome starts blowing up grew to a city of close to one million people by the year one in the common era and of course the common era means before the common era after the common era when we started numbering the years one through 2000 and I, I never remember what the year is I guess it's 2013 now how did the use of wine in Roman culture differ from that in ancient Greece well I think you can look at this in a lot of different ways which you should probably do right now is kind of pause this and think about it if you haven't already thought about it yet maybe even write down an answer in your notes there think through it and then come right back to me in a second here the rise of Islam, and I mean, there are different ways of looking at this. You could say that Muslims just decided that, and Muhammad decided that, you know, alcohol is not important to us because it was important to the Romans and the Christians of that time period in the West. And so they were making a separation between the two. And I think that makes some sense culturally, um, differentiating themselves. But Muhammad's words were that wine and games of chance are abominations devised by Satan and to avoid them, uh, and if you avoid them, you have a better chance to prosper. And I think it does make some sense because what he was trying to tell his followers was this isn't a way that's going to help you improve your life. In fact, the punishment for those who failed to abide to the prohibition of alcohol, 40 lashes and... Um, that's not with a wet noodle. I mean, that's like the real deal. So, uh, the next time we get a chance to talk, we'll be looking at the spirits in the colonial period. And this will be kind of fun. We'll look at some pirates, um, Americans for the first time. Uh, and again, sadly, many more slaves will be involved. Um, and maybe this will be kind of spooky as well because we're talking about spirits in the colonial period. Ooh, spirits. It's not even Halloween yet. We'll see you next time. <laughs>